again, we welcome you all to our morning service. Um, one announcement I believe we missed was uh, Dr. Clock and Mrs. Clock should be leaving tomorrow from Colorado to start heading back to the Sioux. So we should keep, uh, keep them in mind. We sure uh, miss him. School will be starting pretty soon. And uh, if you haven't met him since you've uh, come out in fellowship at our chapel, I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting the man. He set uh, quite an example for myself when I was first saved uh, about six years ago. <clears throat> if you missed this morning's uh, talk, John spoke on true discipleship and uh, really enjoyed the message. He brought out some points as to the terms of what God wants us to do as disciples for himself. And in it, he spoke of total commitment, self-denial, or pardon me, denial of ourselves, to serve the living and true God, and the fact that the world would not accept our standard because our standard is a standard that's given to us by God himself. And then again, as Jerry mentioned, his relatives coming up, unsaved, or the heathens versus, uh, versus the Christians. This is what the world thinks of a Christian, that they're just a, a, a far-out people that have... Uh, found a need and they had to go religious to make their ways meet or they wouldn't have lived another day or whatever. The topic that I would like to look at today is almost in association with John's and that's the uh, Old Testament and New Testament comparison of separation. Do you ever notice sometimes why your family says, why can't you do this? I know my family, everything they want to do sometimes usually ends up being on a Sunday. Well, on Sunday, you can go to your brother's house and we can dig this and fix that and build this and do that. And the minute I say, I'm sorry, but my Sundays are closed off, there's uh, retaliation and then rejection. Why do we have to separate? What does the Bible have to say about separation? So the objective I would like to find today is, what are the similarities between the Old and New Testament? Because separation is something that God has demanded right from the, right from the beginning. It's used in a number of different ways. He separated man from animals. He separated uh, the heavens, the waters and the firmament, the land. But I want to look at separation as dealing with God's chosen and those that are unbelievers. Our, one, of, one of the earliest accounts we will find is in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 12, 1, God said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, etc. He gave the Abrahamic covenant at that point, an unconditional covenant of God's grace and mercy. But Abraham had to do something. He had to separate from the family and from the country and go somewhere else. It was demanded by God. The problem was Abraham took Lot with him, you see. God says go, but he took somebody with him. We find every time God demands separation from an individual, somehow the individual violates what God wants them to do. And it produced problems later on. We find in the book of Exodus, God gave the commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. The commandments by purpose, what we find in the book of Romans, was to prove sin more sinful or to show man that he couldn't uh, stand in front of God sinless. It was an impossibility. But the law that he gave them did what? It separated them. It separated them from their licentious, evil life, which in turn separated themselves from the unbelieving at that time who did not want to follow any commandments. They all wanted to do their own thing. So here we find that the law separated people. Then again in Genesis 37, you'll find the account of Jacob and Joseph and his brothers. Here his brothers were very... Um, how would you put it, jealous of Joseph. So they first of all threw him in a pit, but then uh, one didn't want him to die, so they took him out and they sold him into slavery, into Egypt. And Joseph accepted it. And if you'll read the account all the way through it, Joseph stood with the Lord, even though all these things had happened to him. Um, he was a very patient man, even though he was in slavery. But there was an outcome of it all, because little did they realize that God's plan was being fulfilled, even in his ungodly brothers. When they sold him, 
Uh, Joseph stood in his own. In fact, he was even summoned by the king's wife into her parlor, and he rejected, which brought him to a point of imprisonment. Again, he was unjustly being punished by man, but he was being punished for standing up to the separation that God wanted him to be separated by. He predicted famine would come for seven years. And, well, if anybody read the account, the brothers came down to Egypt because they found they had a, a, a seven-year supply or a whole pile of grain that they had kept uh, during the good seasons. And this is something that Joseph had predicted. And then when it was bad, they were coming to buy it. And upon coming down, they met Joseph. At first, they didn't know him. But then finally, he revealed himself to them when they brought down his father. And they took all of the Israelites down into Egypt so that they could survive during a time of famine. It was kind of miraculous in a way because God was calling out a nation of his own. The Jewish people at that time were small in number and more than likely with the famine and the pestilence that happened, they might not have survived. They probably would have been just discarded right off the face of the earth. But God miraculously intervened and brought them down into Egypt Although the people were discontent because where they had to go, it was called slavery, and they didn't like that. And after uh, the Pharaoh died, who had known Joseph so well, the new Pharaoh came and he said, what are we going to do with these people? The harder we work them, and the more we try to get rid of them, the more they multiply. And they multiplied and multiplied. So here God was forming a nation of his own. And it's no different than today. Because today God is forming a church of his own. And sometimes we don't like the methods God uses. Can you imagine? He put them in slavery to fulfill a purpose. Can you imagine if all of us today were put in a concentration camp because God wants to fulfill a purpose? Would we say, praise the Lord? Would we have done that if we were in a position that Joseph was in when they put him in, uh, in jail for a, fall, a crime he never committed? God was working out a plan. Things happen, especially in our day and age. Things might happen that really displease us. But how do we know that it's not God's leading, even though the consequences might be to ourselves terrible, but yet God has purpose? Will we uphold ourselves like Joseph did when falsely accused? Or are we going to fall to the side, fall into sin and join the crowd? No. God demanded separation from his people. And here we have Joseph uh, as a true disciple of the Lord. Again, we have another record in Judges. Let me just turn there for a minute. In, uh, in the first chapter of Judges, as the people were returned to the land, God had asked them to separate themselves from the other people. In, uh, I got the wrong reference here, in Exodus, Exodus uh, chapter 34, the Lord states to the people, oh, here we are, he says in 34, verse 12 of the book of Exodus, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you go, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their idols, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons and their daughters play the harlot with their gods. And make thy sons play the harlot with their gods. Thou shalt make thee no melted gods. The Lord was emphatic. When you go back to the land that I have promised you, of course it had to be after the slavery in Egypt, when you're led back with Joshua, Purify the land. Get away. When you go in there, kill them all. He wanted separation. And that's the only way, as recorded in the Old Testament, that they could do it. When Joshua was there, was there as their leader, they were strong in number. But Joshua had to die, as all people have to do. And then they were uh, put under the leadership of judges. And the judges fell quite short of the mark of the leadership that God wanted. In Judges 1.21, it says, And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. Verse 27 says, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of uh, Bathshean. Verse 29, Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. 
Verse 30, neither did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or Nephelol. Neither did Ashar drive out the inhabitants of Akka. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of uh, Beth Shemesha. Here we have God saying, purify the land. And they did, only to the standard that they wanted to do it. If you read another account, as they looked over, they said, my, but those women are beautiful. Let's take them as our wives instead of doing what the Lord wants us to do. Oh, it would look good for them at the moment, but they didn't see the far consequences of what was going to happen. They were disobedient, and this led to spiritual depravity. All of them fell in sin. God did not forsake them, but he punished them for what they had done because they did not separate as he demanded them to do. They kept with the ungodly neighbors. What of today? God has called those in this room that have trusted Christ as their Savior out from the world. This was mentioned this morning by John. If the world hates you, you'll know that it hated me first. It only loves its own. Therefore, they're going to reject you. But some people don't want to have the rejection. I want to be a Christian, but I want to keep my ties. If you tie in with the unsaved world, you're going to have problems. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Evil company corrupts good morals. We've got to get that down. Evil company corrupts good morals. You hang around with them, you're going to act like them, whether you know it or not. And I've seen this happen as I've seen, uh, well, actually I deal more or less with teenagers in the city. As they start hanging around with the wrong crowd, they start becoming like them. Are they going to sit there and walk down the road and talk about the Lord with you? Not for a minute. They want to drag you their way, and there's no compromise on their part. Well, that's the same thing we should have on our part. We should not compromise. We should separate ourselves. Now, my Bible doesn't tell me to hate these people. It doesn't say they're filthy, and if you touch them, you're going to get disease. It says you're not to fellowship with them in their ungodly deeds. How else would we spread the gospel if we rejected all the unsaved people we knew and we just sat around in fellowship with, with each other? That would be wrong. He expects us to bring them the message of salvation. But do remember when you're walking with them that you're supposed to be giving them that message. You're supposed to be living a separated life or you're going to fall into the same problem that the people did in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. Defeat because they wanted to do it their way. We have uh, the kings, Solomon, his ungodly deeds, uh, 700 wives, uh, 300 concubines, led him to where? Worshipping their gods. Now I'm sure if I would have been walking in the days of Solomon and saw him bowing before the god of Ashtaroth or whatever godless god they had, that I would say, do I see anything in this man? Does he look separate? No, he looks just like the world. And that's exactly what happened by compromising and uh, disobeying God. Then the people, after they had the judges, they wanted to reject the judges and have a king. They looked over at the nations and said, My, look at them prosper. They've got everything. Look at us. We have judges. Why can't we reject? Why can't we have a king? And so God says, Great, you'll have a king. Hosea 13, 11. I gave them a king in my anger. Notice he says, in my anger. And I took him away in my wrath. God says, You want to deny me and have... Uh, a monarchy where man rules, go right ahead. And the people did. They did not want to separate from the nations. And what did it end up in? Well, they thought they were doing quite well. They had three fairly good kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. But then all of a sudden we had problems. And uh, 720 B.C., we find the Assyrian captivity coming in. The ten northern tribes went into this captivity, and they never came out of it to this day. They were held captive and they went right in with the world and that was it. The two southern tribes, 586 B.C., went into deportation with King Nebuchadnezzar. They are coming out of it because God had to, pull, or had to work through a line so that we could have Jesus Christ born of a certain tribe, etc., right through the Old Testament. The point being, they did not see the outcome of their compromise, did they? They didn't see captivity. They saw blessing and glory. Boy, we'll be like the nations. We're going to thrive now. But they had nothing but problems. The result was confusion. It was compromise. And actually was every evil work. God sets a standard. We have recorded in uh, the book of Ezra. 
Let me just turn here. It's a small book to find. There we go. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. <clears throat> for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mixed themselves with the people of the holy lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers uh, being first in the trespass. And when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my mantle, etc. Then in verse 7 it says, <clears throat> Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword of to captivity and to a spoil and to confusion of face as it is this day you see this was a time when they were rebuilding the temple this is the time when the two southern tribes came out of their captivity and wanted to restore the walls and temple of jerusalem but they recognized that they had made a mistake they had led their own sons and daughters into this depraved state by having them intermarry with these other people and it was wrong. And it's no different in the New Testament today. The New Testament does not want a believer mixing in that close of a relationship with an unbeliever, especially in a marital state, or going out with one another, because problems will occur. What do you have in common? But then again, if you are saved in that state, in 1 Corinthians 7, we're told, abide there as a good example to the unsaved part, that they might, through your uh, conduct, and with the word of God, be one and saved. The point being, they disobeyed God. They did not want to separate in the Old Testament. And not only was God, uh, did God want separation from the people, he wanted separation in worship. Why do you think he made a tabernacle in the wilderness? Out of all the land that was around, for miles around, and all the nations and people, God said, make me a tabernacle in the wilderness roughly 60 by 40 with the outer walls one gate one entrance one door just like jesus christ said today i am the door by me if any man enter he shall go in and out and find pasture no other way all that land but you could only come through here for fellowship with god because he demanded separation he didn't say well how do they do it just introduce some of our principles with them and we'll worship the way they want to worship will call their gods idols or relics. For the life of me, I don't know why people get angered. Christians, I'm speaking of, when you mention somebody by name. I came out of the Catholic Church, and it's one of the greatest apostasies there is today as far as I'm concerned. The Pope is just one of the antichrists that rules the world today. I'm not allowed to say this when we have our uh, TV going through the fall. I can't say it on a, a non-paying channel. Maybe I'll save up some money and go in the paying channel so I can mention them by name. Because I saw one day them tear down the Christian right from the roots. As a priest was being interviewed, he said, them born-again Christians, they're, they're, they're just whacked out. They're crazy people. They just, uh, they're, they're wrong. They're dead wrong. They're not following the true principles of the church. He had the nerve. I couldn't even trace him through Toronto. I tried finding the tape so that we could turn around and put somebody on and debate against them. But it was to no avail. But nobody says anything about that. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I turn around and tell you that those ca the Catholic theology is wrong, well, I go to the Catholic Church and I'm a believer. I met a guy at work that said that. When we got into a discussion of this book, we separated. He couldn't stand being with me because I took him to all nice little passages that showed how the Catholic Church was wrong. You don't mix worship. God didn't bring all the tribes into the tabernacle. It was one way. There was one priest, one high priest once a year that went into the Holy of Holies. Anybody else died. That's how separated God's worship is. It should be the same thing today. Now, people uh, grow in maturity, obviously. If you meet a new believer that came out of, let's say, the Catholic Church, you don't jump on them. You talk to them as a baby. That's what Paul says they did. You nourish, you, you cherish them as a nurse cherishes a child. You have to be very careful with them. But listen, there's no excuse if after they put on some spiritual teeth and start devouring the meat of the word, 
that they should stay in a place of worship like that. It's wrong as far as I'm concerned. If I'm to be corrected, correct me later. The point is God does not separate, pardon me, God does separate his worship. And it should be the same thing today. Today we have a council, the WCC, Worldwide Council of Churches. They set the standard. Hey, look, we've got to love one another. Let's get all together. It's an ecumenical council or neo-orthodoxy. It's wrong, dead wrong, because they have to lay down, or pardon me, lay aside the principles laid down in God's word. Now, you tell me where that's right. It's not right, because God demanded separation in the Old Testament. What's, what's, what's the difference between the Old and New Testament? We are still God's chosen people. And it's just going to lead to problems. How did Christ uh, treat the relig religious leaders in Matthew 23? He didn't call them, well, nice guys. Uh, you think we can get together and discuss? Maybe we'll, uh, we'll get a certain form of worship and uh, we'll get your ways and ours. We'll figure something out. <laughs> no, not a chance. He separated completely. He said, you vipers, you snakes, you hypocrites. Who shall deliver you from the wrath to come? Because they did not want to change. So Christ separated himself from them. The money changers in the, in the temple of worship, he threw them out. They're to be separate. Worship is very important to God because God says, I'm seeking those who are willing to worship me. But he says, my way, not your way. You worship God his way through his word. Don't be blinded by a misguiding light. Don't you for one minute see the, or, or ever think that. We have programs on TVs, I watch them, where you have a Christian and you have people from all denominations together. I'm not judging the heart, but I'm judging the issues of how do you worship God. We worship Him His way, not with compromise, but with separation, separation in worship. And you know, He has not for one minute changed His demand for separation in the New Testament. If you would turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we have one of the most elaborate accounts of separation. The reason I want to look at this scripture is because I've read an article by a liberal theologian who said, don't take it too far, gang. We're not, what 2 Corinthians 6.14 is, is talking about is, is not as strict as you think. It's not really asking for total separation, it's just a little bit of separation. Well, I, I just want to look at this portion of Scripture for the remaining few minutes and see what God has to say. Now remember, the same God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He has the same standard. He hasn't changed. As Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and if you do a study on him, you'll find out they were a very backslidden church. A lot of baby Christians. 1 Corinthians 3 elaborates upon that. Finally, when you come up to uh, the second letter, he says in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Right off the bat, he's not asking us. He's commanding us not to be unequally yoked. If you ever see a picture, I like watching those old pictures where they have the big oxen and they're pulling a plow through a field. I like watching the brute power and those beasts. But they have a yoke. They have a, a common harness with a hole for their head and they're just tugging away. Can you imagine putting an ox on one side and putting a dog in the other one? Now, wouldn't that look a little bit funny? You'd, you'd have a dog with a long neck or you'd have a, a dead hound as the ox is trying to pull away. They'd be probably going in circles or he probably wouldn't be able to pull the load while this poor dog was dangling from the yoke. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The same thing. We look just as stupid as far as I'm concerned as a hound and an ox in a yoke with a believer and an unbeliever. It looks the same way. There's something wrong and the job is not going to get done. The believer is going to be hindered just as the dog will hinder the ox. So will the unbeliever hinder the believer in that kind of a relationship. Stop being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And he gives five definite reasons why. Four, number one, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. What fellowship have they? Well, just think about it. Righteousness is the opposite to unrighteousness. 1 Peter 3.12 says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Yet if we look in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But thanks be to God through the 
uh, efficacy, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are made righteous. Made righteous. That's why we have fellowship with God. And that's why an unbeliever does not have fellowship with God, because he's unrighteous. He's self-righteous. He's within his own sin. And they don't mix. Secondly, he says, and what communion has light with darkness? <clears throat> that word communion means what do they have in common? 1 John 1, 5 tells me God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You can't have the two together. If we were to shut off the lights in a dark room, well, then what's there? Darkness. You can't have the two together. And now how definite uh, can we be about separation than by light and darkness? They're two complete opposites. Then in verse 15, uh, the third statement, and what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what communion? Or what uh, harmony has Christ with the devil himself? That word symphoneo is used as in a symphony. We get the word symphony from it. Now, when you see a symphony, everything's in accord. Everything's going just beautiful, mixed together. But he says, what kind of fellowship does Christ have with the devil? When Christ speaks a word, it's truth. When the devil speaks a word, it's lie. They have nothing in common whatsoever. Nothing at all. Fourthly, he goes, or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? Or that word means unbeliever. What part has a believer with an unbeliever? Well, must I go on? It's the same as light and darkness. It's the same as Christ and Satan. No fellowship at all. Now that's cutting it quite straight. That's not saying, well, there's a... No, God says, cut it straight. Shut the light. Darkness. No fellowship between the devil and my son. Finally, on the fifth point, he says, and what agreement as the temple of God with idols. <clears throat> we find that God abhors idols. There were no idols in the, the Old Testament tabernacle. What was in there is what God wanted. Nothing less, nothing more. But that's done away with. We had the temporary tabernacle in the wilderness where God dwelt among the people. Then we had the temple made by Solomon, but it was destroyed. Then we had Zerubbabel's temple, and it was destroyed where God dwelt among the people. Then in the New Testament, we had Herod's temple. But God wasn't pleased to dwell in that temple because he was not the author of its construction. It was destroyed by Titus in 70 AD. But today we have, well, there was one more I failed to mention. It was the temple of Jesus Christ himself, but they destroyed him. Now he says, what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, of the living God. Now he's looking at us. All other things destroyed. God dwells within us. There was no idols in his temples. There shouldn't be any idols within our temples whatsoever. That's why he says, what agreement has a temple of God with idols? None at all. Cut it straight. No agreement whatsoever. And then he quotes from Ezekiel 37, 26 here. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Why does he quote from Ezekiel 20, or 37? Because I believe he's dealing with righteousness. Because Ezekiel 37 is pointing to the thousand-year reign when righteousness will reign on earth again, and Christ will be the righteous judge. And anybody that alters or tries to alter the rule when he's sitting on his throne... It says in Ezekiel, he'll be put to death and his carcass will be left in his ex as an example to others that there'll be no compromise in the kingdom to come. And it's the same thing right now. He says, don't you for one minute compromise. You are my temple. I'll walk with you. Notice the promises. He says, I'll be a father to you. Now, <clears throat> how far do we go? <clears throat> I mean, there's, everything is not a clear-cut case. We know we have to bring the message to the unsaved. But I know, for instance, what about friends? Well, I think it's you know, clear and cut in the scriptures. Evil company corrupts good morals. Evil company corrupts good morals. What about the job? <clears throat> Are we to be like them? No, we're to be shining lights, the salt of the earth, even on the job to other people. We're not to sit around with them and get into their dirty jokes or whatever. What about business? When I got saved, I was in business with a person. 
And I ended up getting out of that business, absorbing a loss that took me four years to pay because I just couldn't stand it no more. Well, let's take this money here and the government won't see this tax right off. And, you know, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do it anymore. <clears throat> it was cut and dry. I absorbed the loss, but I was so thankful that I didn't have to go through that compromising situation anymore. And I've seen people get into business with the, in the saved and the unsaved realm, and problems occur because the unsaved couldn't care less about worship. Hey, let's work seven days a week. Forget the Lord. We've got to be prosperous. That's wrong. What about marriage? Well, it's clear cut in the Bible. We have to be examples for our children. Because if you let them go out with unsaved, what do you think the unsaved are looking for? If you look around at the teenagers today, most of them are looking just for a good time, a one-night stand, or whatever the case may be. And that's not what God demands of his children. He's looking for separation in all realms of life. <clears throat> he says, come out, in verse 17, as he concludes, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Three imperative commands, all in a row, and they're all aorist tense verbs. It's an act that's completed. He says, come out once and for all, in other words, from among them. And he says, be separate. That's an aorist passive verb. So that means that we don't separate ourselves. He does the separating. That's what the passive voice indicates here. In other words, you come out from among them, and I will make you separated. I will separate you. And how is he going to do it? John 17, 17, Christ said to the Father, Sanctify them, or set them apart through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Until you come out from among them, God is not going to effectually work, or work with his word in you because you are uh, holding him back from doing what he wants to do. Come out once and for all, and I will make you separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. Another command. Once and for all, get rid of the idols. Once and for all, get rid of the wrong relationships and establish a relationship with your Father in heaven. And he says, I will receive you. We're not speaking of salvation here. We're speaking of fellowship. The word ace decamai means to take into one's favor. God is looking for sweet fellowship with, with what he had lost in the beginning, but now he has regained through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But it's up to us to complete the fellowship with the Father. He's not going to force us to do it. We have also recorded in Hebrews 12, uh, where we deal with chastisement. <clears throat> Just let me read it for you. Because he says here, in verse 18, I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He says in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh who corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our prophet, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Isn't that beautiful? God wants to chasten us. He wants to be called Father, and he wants us to have that relationship so that he can make us more holy. That's why he says, I will separate you. He wants us to live a life of holiness. And then at the end he says, I give you reward for faith, uh, faithful service. Then he finally says in chapter 7, verse 1, which actually is, a, as far as I'm concerned, a wrong division. That should be verse 19, actually, of uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Because he concludes, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants physical and he wants spiritual separation. He wants us to complete our holiness with him. He's given us a lifetime to do it, and nobody's going to be without excuse on Judgment Day. Well, I didn't really have enough time. God has given each one of us ample time. So what's the conclusion of the matter? The God of the Old Testament, who is the God of the New Testament, demands separation. Not compromise, separation. He wants us to separate so they can look at us and say, hey, there is a, there is a reality in what they believe. He doesn't want us to amalgamate. That's wrong by the scriptures. Christian, we, it's up to us actually to make this move. Every one of us has that option. It's an option. God wants it as a command, 
but we are the ones that have to enact it so he can work through us. Allow God to work in you. Remember God's holiness. That's why he says, <clears throat> perfecting holiness in fear of God. When you stop fearing God, you stop fearing punishment. And then you have a problem. Then you have a problem. Remember his holiness and you will live a life of fear. Not in the sense of horrid fear, but reverential trust knowing the holiness of God. And yet that holy God says, I want to talk with you. That is what a, what a relationship each individual can have. Jesus Christ, the Lord of all eternity, wants to walk with us. And then we're going to discuss the issues for all eternity at the marriage feast of the Lamb. It's just going to be great. Keep that in mind. It's our choice to live either a life of holiness or a life of defeat. Compromise, you'll live defeatedly as a Christian. But if you separate onto a life of holiness, then you will lead a, a much more mature life as a Christian. <clears throat> and remember to treat the unsaved as special, not as dogs. I'm not promoting that today. I'm just showing you that you have to be separate because God hasn't altered His plan. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and yea forever. <clears throat> Let me conclude with one verse. Danny used it at the Lord's table this morning. It's a beautiful verse. I think it was Danny. It says in 2 Peter 3.10, could have been Pat, I'm not too sure. But anyway, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? Remember, everything that takes you away from God here burns up in eternity. But everything that you set aside and separate yourselves onto true worship to God goes on forever and ever. God demands worship. And that is important. Just as important as the message John gave on discipleship. Because until you separate, you're not going to be a true disciple of the Lord. Now, disciple, methetes, means a learner. I'm not saying you're not going to be a true believer of the Lord. But a learner is one who follows the teacher and the master. Well, there it is. He demands separation, learn it, and practice it throughout your Christian days. And you will be prosperous the way the Lord wants you to prosper on this earth. Don't look like they looked in the Old Testament on the other nations. Because you're always going to say, hey, look what they have. But you get them to look that way and say, hey, look what I have. Look what I have. And I don't pay taxes when I go to my mansion. Just like you've got to pay taxes for your beautiful estate or whatever the case may be. Don't look that way. Keep looking up. That's why Paul wrote in Colossians, set your affections on things above, not on the things on earth. Let us pray. Again, our Father, we just thank you that you've given us your unadulterated and perfect word. Again, Father, we thank you for your character, a character of holiness, a character that is to be separate from all other gods. Father, help us to have this character of holiness that we might separate ourselves onto service for you. And yet, Father, not looking at it grudgingly, but looking at it as true service for a true master and a great God. Yet, our Father, we seem to fall so often into temptation. We thank you that we can confess and regain our fellowship with you. Our Father, as we go through this week, help us to meditate upon your word, to open it daily, to be good examples to the ones around us and to our families. We thank you for one another. Give us safety and travel. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.